Good afternoon. My name is David Johnson. I am the executive director for the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law, also known as CERL. And I thank you for joining us for the second in our virtual briefing series on the legal dimensions of the Israel-Hamas war. The ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas raises critical questions about the application and interpretation of the law of armed conflict, also known as LOAC, and which is also known as international legal principles governing the conduct of war. The Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law is pleased to host experts in national security, military strategy, and the law of war to discuss these critical topics. CERL is a nonpartisan interdisciplinary institute dedicated to preserving and promoting ethics and the rule of law in national security, warfare, and domestic democratic governance. Affiliated with the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania, CERL draws from the study of law, philosophy, ethics, to answer difficult questions that arise in times of war and contemporary transnational conflicts. CERL brings together policymakers, professionals across the legal, military, intelligence, and business sectors to research, analyze, and to make policy recommendations that address today's most challenging issues, such as domestic violent extremism, the use of uh, force um, in these situations. Um, I would like to start out with a few housekeeping rules before we uh, introduce uh, today's moderator. Please note that um, you can answer your questions in the Q&A section of the uh, webinar and click send. This event will be recorded and at approximately 1240, we'll open up the Q&A portion of this event. I am pleased to introduce our moderator, Professor Clara Finkelstein, who founded Searle in 2012 and is Searle's faculty, and she is Searle's faculty director. She is the Algernon Biddle Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania, and more uh, precisely, the Carey School of Law. Professor Finkelstein, it's my pleasure to introduce you. We have a busy day. <laughs> thank you so much, Dave, and thanks so much to all of you and to our panelists for being here today. Um, on Friday morning, uh, a tenuous and delicate ceasefire broke down when Hamas rockets moments before the ceasefire pierced the silence uh, and uh, all indications were that there was no further willingness to exchange hostages uh, for uh, release of Palestinian prisoners. Uh, we have since seen a resumption of the Israeli offensive in the south of Gaza. Um, and the fighting has resumed with incredible intensity. Um, there is no indication uh, that further exchange of hostages is on the table, though diplomatic efforts continue to try to get uh, a hostage uh, deal and further uh, release of hostages uh, back uh, on the table. Um, this is a critical moment, obviously, for ongoing hostilities and for the war and criticisms of Israel and of its operations continue to mount, uh, civilian casualties continue to mount. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our two expert guests today. Uh, first, General Joseph Votel. Uh, recently retired as a four-star general in the United States Army after a nearly 40-year career. His most recent leadership position was as commander of U.S. Central Command, a position he held from March 2016 uh, to March 2019. Prior to CENTCOM, he was the commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, SOCOM, and the Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC. He was the commander of the 75th Ranger Regiment when they deployed to Afghanistan in 2001 and to Iraq in 2003. While assigned to the Pentagon, he organized the original IED task force that eventually grew into the Joint Improvised Threat Defeat Organization. During his military career, General Votel gained extensive operational experience across the Middle East, the Levant, Central and South Asia, Northern Africa, and the Horn of Africa. He was awarded numerous medals of service, including three Defense Distinguished Service Medals, an Army Distinguished Service Medal, 
three Defense Superior Service Medals, two Legion of Merit Medals, and four Bronze Star Medals. I am also delighted to say that he is uh, a member of the Searle Executive Board uh, and a great advisor uh, to the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law, or Searle. Thank you so much, General Votel, for being with us. Uh, next, we have Ord Kittry, who is a law professor at Arizona State University and a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. In 2021, Ord received the Serge Lazareff Prize awarded by NATO Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe for exceptional contributions to NATO in the legal arena. Ord is the author of a marvelous book called Lawfare, Law as a Weapon of War, published by Oxford University Press. I had the pleasure and privilege of, in fact, reviewing this book some years ago. Uh, and so I knew of Ord and his work um, long before now. Um, prior to entering academia, Ord served for 11 years in legal and policy positions at the U.S. State Department, where he received the Department's Superior Honor Award and its Meritorious Honor Award, and he is a great expert in the law of armed conflict. Thank you so much to both of you gentlemen for joining us today. I'm going to ask uh, Joe whether or not you would be willing to give us the update of the week with which we start each of these briefings. Tell us what happened this week and give us some of your thoughts uh, about the tragic end to the temporary ceasefire and the resumption of fighting. What really brought about the end of the ceasefire and what has the reporting been since the resumption of hostilities? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Claire. And great, uh, great to be with you. Um, so what we've seen here since the resumption of uh, of operations last Friday is uh, is is Israel continue with their campaign into into Gaza, and most recently, of course, in the last 24, 36 hours, has actually entered into the southern part of of Gaza. And uh, reporting yesterday indicated that they'd actually entered the town of Khan Yunus, which is the second uh, largest town in in Gaza. Uh, and one of the primary locations where many who had left the north uh, had had actually gone down to. Um, so uh, fighting continues in and around that area. Reports are that uh, Israeli forces, like they did in Gaza City, move quickly to gain control of of uh, of uh, uh, locations in the in the center part of the city from which they will kind of. Uh, operate from to conduct their continuing clearing operations. At the same time, they've continued their operations up in the northern part of Gaza. Uh, most uh, most recently, in the last couple of days, really folks around the city of Jabalia, uh, which we've all read about here several weeks ago. Um, so that fighting continues up there. Um, I would describe this as a lot of back clearing, going back and addressing areas which they bypassed uh, during their initial operations and. Uh, and uh, in addressing the, the Hamas threats there. Palestinian militia fighters have continued to target uh, Israeli defense forces throughout Gaza uh, in both the north and the south, and we should expect to continue to see that going on as, uh, as well. And both uh, Palestinian militias and Lebanese Hezbollah have continued to launch attacks, largely air attacks, into, um, <clears throat> into Israel. Um, th these are continuing at a kind of, kind of a normal, normal if you can describe it that way, pace of about 10 to 12 attacks per day coming in each of these areas. But yet it, uh, it does indicate that this continues to be areas where the militias and Lebanese Hezbollah is continuing to try to hold uh, Israel at risk. Um, attacks across the region have continued against U.S. troops and facilities, particularly in Iraq and Syria. Uh, with the U.S. Re, uh, re responding the, uh, in, on, on, on several occasions uh, by attacks against the, uh, the perpetrators. Perpetrators in this case are principally limited to two particular groups, Kitab Hezbollah, who we know very well from our experience in, in, um, in, uh, in, in Iraq over, uh, over the last 20 years, and then an organization referred to as Han, Harakat, Hezbollah, Al-Nujba, uh, uh, which again is a, is another Iranian aligned militia, uh, but has been uh, been perpetrated in a number of these attacks. Um, and then of course we've heard about the Houthis and what they've been doing 
uh, down on the southern part of the of the red uh, of the Red Sea. Israeli defense forces and Palestinian fighters have clashed in yes just in the last 24 hours uh, in about nine different towns around the West Bank, and that continues to be uh, a, a focus of, of significant uh, conflict and contact. Uh, between both sides, uh, and, and and that level of violence has remained fairly steady now for several weeks throughout uh, throughout this conflict. As you noted, Claire, the hostage negotiations are remain at an impasse here. Although the reporting is that hostage families are continuing to put a lot of pressure on the Israeli government to get back onto it. Um, uh, the Israeli government, I think, for their part, at least their spokes. Uh, persons have been indicating that they believe that military pressure is needed uh, to force a return to negotiations. And certainly that seems to be the track that they're on. Uh, and then finally, as, as you noted, the humanitarian situation remains fairly dire here. 1.8 million Gazans um, uh, displaced. Uh, the UN uh, Relief and Works Agency is reporting that about 1.2, as of the 3rd of December, about 1.2 million of those were located in UNRWA uh, installations really around uh, around Gaza. Um, um, so it means that there's there's a lot that are still moving around. Of course, the, the operations in southern Gaza will will add to uh, add to some of that. So I'll, I'll stop there, Claire, and happy to answer any questions you might and have. And just just before we go off the briefing portion of our discussion, Joe, do you have do we have reason to think that these various attacks that the that the Hamas resumption of hostilities um, the Houthi attacks, the Han, um, the Iranian aligned militia, et cetera, um, and the West Bank activity, how, how much of this is coordinated and how much of these are just sort of separate <clears throat> um, copying or um, inspired action? Well, I, I think there's no doubt that all of these are linked together. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure I can talk about the, the, ex, the, uh, the degrees of coordination that are actually taking place, but they certainly, they certainly are connected here. And I and I and I would assess that there is a level of coordination between, um, if maybe not between each of these groups, but certainly between these groups and their supporters and, and in uh, uh, principle, uh, Iran. <clears throat> so most of these efforts are designed to, uh, you know, continue to draw attention away from what is happening in in Hamas. It is designed to uh, wear down American will, uh, and then uh, you know I think they are they're very much focused on trying to create create casualties on our side uh, as as well, and and all that that will ensue. I think it's important to appreciate part of the reason that Hamas launched this original operation was to force an overreaction, not just from Israel, but from the international community. So all of these are designed to do the same thing. I think the Houthis are a little bit different case here. Uh, they certainly are very beholden to, uh, to Iran, but I think they are looking to uh, portray themselves as a big player in this. Look at us. We are actually taking action against uh, Israeli, supposed Israeli vessels and the great Satan who is uh, down here trying to protect them in this part of the area. So there's no doubt they're trying to use this to bolster their own political standing as well. Um, and uh, you know, a reporting I've heard is if you look at the news and what's being reported in Yemen, this is all over. So it is very much being portrayed as uh, as as negative towards uh, towards Muslims, and that is playing up. And I think the Yemeni, um, uh, the um, uh, Houthis who are who are in control are, are are playing that up to a high degree. Right, or. Tell us a little, let's talk a little bit about uh, casualty numbers and also what the Israelis are doing or not doing to minimize civilian casualties. Um, the Hamas-run health authority numbers have casualty numbers at about 15,000 now of civilians. Um, we talked last week a little bit about this, but I'd like to have your take on this, how reliable are those numbers? How much can we trust those numbers? What do those numbers include and not include? 
Yeah, thanks. And thanks for organizing this. I, I don't think those numbers are trustworthy as, at all. Uh, the, you know, this is uh, Hamas, uh, which uh, part of their strategy is to drive up uh, civilian casualties on the Palestinian side in order to discredit uh, Israel. Uh, this originally was the Hamas led health ministry issuing uh, these numbers. Now, my understanding is that it is the uh, communications ministry the PR arm of Hamas. Uh, and if you scratch the surface of their numbers, their numbers seem really inconsistent. They jump up on sort of odd days and jump down on odd days. And um, they also uh, don't include uh, uh, Palestinians who were killed by uh, uh, Palestinian fire, uh, such as the Palestinian uh, rocket that uh, hit, hit uh, the one hospital's parking lot. They also, the numbers also don't include, um, they, they don't break out a Palestinian uh, military versus uh, civilian uh, casualties. So I think the numbers, and, and Joe Biden, uh, to his credit, President Biden, to his credit, has repeatedly said this, I don't think the numbers are reliable at all. Right, and and as as you make the point, um, they do not include Hamas fighters. Um, so when you say um, military versus civilians, um, they're presented as civilian casualty numbers, but we actually don't know how many Hamas fighters um, have been have been killed that may be included in those numbers. Um, now, now let's talk about. Um, human shielding for a moment, uh, since that was intended to be the focus uh, of today's briefing. Um, one thing that the numbers don't include is how many individuals are being killed because of the practice of human shielding. And that is extremely hard to assess. But if you could give us, or you are an expert in the law of armed conflict and uh, how it relates to um, human shielding, a little bit of the background around human shielding practices um, and, and the law of armed conflict relating to that, and then how we should think about those casualty numbers in relation to the practice of human shielding. Yeah, so human shields is, it's defined as the use of civilians or other protected persons to shield military objectives from lawful attack or to deliberately cause civilian casualties. Uh, it's commonly referred to as the use of human shields. This war crime is prohibited by the Geneva Conventions and by customary international law. It's also listed as a war crime uh, by the International Criminal Court's Rome Statute, which isn't necessarily applicable here, but uh, it's listed there as a war crime. Numerous criminal cases have confirmed that using human shields amounts to a war crime. There were, by my count, uh, five cases in the in, uh, ICTY, uh, the uh, International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, that discussed the use of human shields. And the UN Security Council has, by my count, uh, condemned the use of human shields, mostly in the Afghan conflict, in 18 different UN Security Council resolutions uh, over the years. So this is a, this is a concept which has been uh, out there, but uh, it's really come to the forefront uh, with regard to this uh, particular uh, conflict. Uh, President Biden has at least in four sets of remarks charged Hamas with using civilians as human shields. On November 12th, the 27 European Union nations jointly declared the EU condemns the use of hospitals and civilians as human shields by Hamas. The European Commission president, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, stated that Hamas is clearly using innocent Palestinians and hostages as human shields. It's horrific. It is pure evil, she said. And on October 26th, the European Council said the use of civilians as human shields by Hamas is a particularly deplorable atrocity. So you have the international community condemning uh, Hamas uh, for using human shields. And uh, yet at the same time, you have uh, folks condemning uh, the Israelis and the Israelis are in a bit uh, of, a, of a bind. 
uh, under LOAC, when uh, law of armed conflict, when conducting attacks, parties to a conflict must take precautions that are feasible under the operational circumstances to minimize civilian death or injury, as well as damage to civilian objects. So the uh, IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, are taking various precautionary uh, measures, uh, advance warnings, their choice of weapons and munitions. Uh, they've repeatedly called on civilians to temporarily evacuate northern Gaza. Uh, and uh, these are some of the things that the Israelis are doing in the face of the use of human shields by uh, Hamas to nevertheless uh, reduce the um, uh, death toll, uh, the very regrettable civilian death toll uh, to the extent possible while the Israelis try to achieve their objective, uh, which is to ensure that Hamas can never again do what it did on October 7th. So now I have a very technical question for you, Ord, which is um, if you have a hospital and you have major um, military operations located under that hospital or in the vicinity of that hospital, uh, of course, the hospital loses its uh, immune status under international law. But the analysis can't end there because there are still civilians on the ground in that hospital, around that hospital. So you still have to engage in a proportionality assessment. We discussed some of this last week. Is your proportionality assessment, uh, not that it's such a fine uh, you know, science, but is your proportionality assessment the same for a facility where there are civilians that has lost its immunity status as it would be where there is no shielding and you're just trying to watch out for a civilian population while conducting military operations? Uh, good question. Look, from a legal perspective, there's some debate as to the degree to which you adjust uh, what you're doing uh, in the face of um, uh, what we call involuntary human shields, to what degree the calculus changes. But in fact, the Israelis have been, uh, in, in my view, treating uh, the calculus as if it is changed. Uh, they didn't, you know, flatten Al-Shifa Hospital. Uh, they, there were actually very few combat casualties right around Al-Shifa Hospital. As I understand, there were some patients, regrettably, who, who, who were injured or killed. Uh, but uh, here, here, you know, the evidence is pretty strong that uh, Al-Shifa Hospital was used as a command and control center. Uh, Joe Biden uh, announced that Hamas had headquartered its military operations underneath Shifa Hospital. He labeled it a war crime, um, and he added that Israel had taken precautions to limit civilian casualties in the hospital incursion. Uh, John Kirby, uh, the um, U.S. Uh, National Security Council spokesperson, also said, we have information that confirms that Hamas is using that particular hospital for command and control mode and probably did store weapons. He said that is a war crime. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the Israelis, uh, in my view, treaded pretty carefully. Uh, they surrounded it. They gave people notice to escape. Uh, they probably lost the opportunity to rescue hostages that were being held there. And they certainly left, uh, lost the opportunity to uh, detain or kill Hamas leaders who were in that hospital because the Israelis telegraphed what they were doing and people were allowed to escape. And lo and behold, they arrived there and there were the tunnels, but the tunnels had been largely stripped of. There were still weapons and there was still evidence that they were used as command and control centers, but there was a lot less than if the Israelis had just, uh, you know, surprised attacked without giving notice. Right. And as, as I understand, Hamas may also have covered up some evidence of tunnels, making them more difficult to discover. Mm -hmm. Joe, tell us a little bit about what we should expect when we find a Hamas command and control center. I mean, is this going to look like the, you know, um, War, a war room in the Pentagon, or is this going to look, what does it look like for, um, you know, a, a terrorist cell like Hamas to have a command and control center? What would we expect to be finding as evidence of major terrorist operations in and around these civilian uh, points of civilian infrastructure? Well, I, I don't think we should expect to find something like we might find the Pentagon or one of our own 
um, kind of conventional uh, military organizations uh, in terms of command and control, you know, a bunch of screens and people and kind of a, a you know, a formal setup. I mean, there may be some aspects of that that are taking place, but I think the, I think it's important to appreciate the uh, kind of the characteristics of, of Hamas and, and terrorist organizations in general. I mean, they operate in a much more cellular, uh, much more decentralized manner. Uh, they make use of, of uh, cellular phones and radios and other things to communicate a lot of their instructions uh, for what they're doing. Uh, and they and they try to do that from places where they have some some safety, some ability to to communicate and actually coordinate uh, activities uh, back and forth. So a lot of that is done by word of mouth, is done by passing instructions, is done through normal communications things, not necessarily through sophisticated um, systems like we might see in a in a more Western command and control aspect. The fact of the the fact is that uh, I think. Uh, I mean, as I kind of think about this, is that what they are what they are really doing is they're using the kind of the protected status of the hospital, the protected status of the of the doctors and the patients that are involved in that to to kind of further their own military uh, objectives, and uh, with the recognition that Western militaries and I would lump the Israelis into that as well would uh, would 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 certainly have pause uh, going into this. So they're trying to gain an advantage by exploiting uh, the civilian population. And that's what I think the, that's what I think the big aspect is here. So you have some uh, considerable experience, of course, fighting in terrain where you have both a densely packed uh, urban environment like in Mosul as well as in more rural environments like in Afghanistan. Can you talk about the differences, um, the special <clears throat> challenges in urban environments and what you do to try to minimize civilian casualties in environments like that? Yeah, so you're absolutely right, Claire. And I think it's an important point for the audience to appreciate is that, you know, the low act and concern about civilians isn't just something we worry about in the in these in these heavily dense urban areas. This is an all the time uh, consideration that has to has to be has to be looked at all the time. So so I'll I'll, I'll try to describe a couple different scenarios here for you. And let's let's just talk about Mosul. And this is not necessarily an apples to apples comparison here. I mean, in our our role in Iraq, we were supporting the uh, the Iraqi defense uh, security forces who were largely doing most of the fighting. That included a, a variety of uh, popular mobilization forces, militias, if you will, that were also kind of oriented on this and, and doing the same thing. So we were really in the enabling um, uh, mode for them. But one of the things that we that we did, and we learned this as we went through the campaign, was that we we appreciate we began we developed a very deep appreciation for how important it was to plan our military operations in conjunction with humanitarian uh, operations. So, you know, at the time, 2016, as we were getting ready to go to Mosul, uh, there was actually a fairly well-developed humanitarian architecture in place and largely led by Americans and and, and other and a, and a variety of other international leaders who were involved in UN organizations and a lot of non-governmental organizations that were providing assistance in, in Iraq. And what we were able to do is we were able to leverage those relationships we have with them to actually can do some planning so we could plan for humanitarian corridors, which would deconflict it from where our military operations would take. We were planning for assembly areas. We helped to facilitate um, the movement of supplies uh, to those locations so they could do that. So my point is, is that I think one of the important things is, is this idea of of planning and coordinating before operations with the humanitarian um, humanitarian community to try to minimize as much as you can. And I think we did a good job with it, but we weren't perfect. We still had civilian casualties as a result of this. And uh, inevitably that's that was a feature of the environment. And despite our best efforts there and in other ways, you know, we still we still had that. Uh, it's a little different in Gaza. Um, they, Israel has not had the same run up to this as we did in Mosul, so it's not an exact uh, opposite thing here. And I, my, I get the sense that the humanitarian uh, pieces may not be as well, uh, well uh, architectured right now as uh, as maybe the 
the experience that, that that I had. Hopefully it's getting better. It looks like it is with some movement of materials here. But I think that's an important aspect um, aspect of it. In, in Afghanistan, if I just contrast it with this, you know, we oftentimes were doing operations in, in certainly in small villages and in, in cities, but also really in, in much smaller areas where there were relatively smaller densities of buildings and and civilians there but of course the civilians were always always there and we went through a, what i would describe as a fairly significant metamorphosis here on how we conducted our operations you know we were largely for a number of years conducting strike force operations we'd go at night we'd go we'd bang into someone's home we'd go in find the person we had uh, we were looking for and then take them take them out of there and on occasions that you know that uh, we we had to fight uh, as a as a result of that um and that caused a lot of that caused a lot of problems caused a lot of problems with the afghan government so we had to we had to modify our tactics over time and you know one of the first things we did was get local forces integrated with us that is afghans with with american uh, strike forces going into these areas to help. So you had an Afghan there who's, who spoke, who could, you know, could converse, who could do other things. Um, we, we brought technology to bear. Uh, we used uh, different things that we could, uh, you know, uh, we had a system called Green Beam that allowed us to, um, to you know, project light onto the ground as, a, as kind of an indication that we were in the area. So again, we're trying to provide a visible warning to people that something's going on here so they can take cover. We, we brought females onto our, onto our strike forces. Uh, cultural support team members that we referred to. And this was a big, big win here and really allowed us to, you know, not only have women on there, but um, but uh, converse with uh, with the pop with the other fifty percent of the population that most of us couldn't talk to, uh, and uh, it was it was a major feature. And then of course we ultimately went to a tactic where instead of going straight into an objective, we basically surrounded and we just we called people out. We literally used bullhorns and other mechanisms to bring people out so that we tried to minimize uh, minimize that. Um, so I, I suspect Israel is 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 uh, is applying some of these tactics as well. I don't have the the you know the finite detail of what they're doing, but right. It, so let's talk about different. some of that, some of those measures. And thank you so much for that that lived experience, uh, Joe, which is just uh, unique. Um, the the fact that you can speak to that, uh, and uh, it's important to mention here that uh, President Biden has issued had um, early on in his administration issued something called the Civilian Harm Mitigation Reduction Action Plan, um, uh, which Searle has been extremely interested in and hoping to further and support, um, really designed to think about how to mitigate um, civilian harm in our overseas operations. And, and here is an opportunity for us to support the Israelis in thinking through how they can mitigate civilian harm. Um, so some of the things or that they've been doing is issuing <clears throat> very specific maps with um, uh, fine grained uh, location identifiers um, so that almost block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood and trying to indicate where it may be safe or safer for the civilian uh, population to go and then dropping leaflets uh, to warn, uh, as Joe was saying, warnings being a, a, a part of what you do to mitigate civilian harm. Some of these warnings have also, however, been the subject of intense criticism. Uh, so demands uh, that Israelis have issued to evacuate from the north to the south um, set a, an enormous segment of the Gazan population into migration with estimates being that roughly 80% of uh, the popul civilian population in Gaza um, ha is displaced. Can you speak a little bit to civilian harm mitigation um, efforts on the part of the IDF and whether in your view they've been adequate or is there more that they can, can be doing? So uh, 
Thank you. Yeah, under the law of armed conflict, when conducting attacks, parties to a conflict, including the IDF, must take precautions that are feasible under the operational circumstances to minimize civilian death or injury, as well as damage to civilian objects. So there are a variety of things, as you mentioned, that the IDF does. It's been circulating these uh, maps. Uh, they have also been contacting people. Uh, they have been uh, using text messages uh, and um, uh, phone calls, uh, calling on civilians to evacuate certain places, certain buildings. Uh, this is a, a major part of what the IDF does in an effort to uh, reduce uh, civilian casualties. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Hamas has been uh, not uh, cooperating. Uh, with those efforts. And in fact, as uh, John Kirby, the National Security Council spokesman said, uh, the Hamas has been uh, using uh, huge segments of the Palestinian population in Gaza as human shields by encouraging them not to move. And that is in fact uh, a war crime. And uh, to some degree, uh, the responsibility for civilian casualties shifts to Hamas when they're doing that, when they're purposefully telling uh, civilians to stay in harm's way. Uh, now, the, uh, the Israeli uh, warnings uh, typically go, uh, as I understand it, beyond uh, what LOAC requires. And uh, I've seen repeated references by U.S. JAGs to how Israeli uh, warnings to civilians go well beyond uh, what the practice is by Western uh, militaries uh, in general. Uh, but uh, the IDF is nevertheless uh, being uh, criticized. And, um, you know, so they're, they're uh, in a difficult situation. And I think there's kind of two uh, two drivers of their precautions. One is the law of armed conflict, where I think they're well above and beyond what they're required to do. And then the other is the PR uh, the PR situation, the information warfare situation. You know, what is what is Hamas trying to do here? Hamas is trying to maximize both Israeli civilian casualties and also, frankly, Palestinian civilian casualties. This is how Hamas discredits Israel. This is Hamas uh, uh, achieves its goal of delegitimizing Israel, which was really a major part of the driver for their attack. They were trying to delegitimize Israel to such a degree as to derail the peace process uh, between the Israels, uh, the Israelis and the Saudis in particular. And they do that by uh, driving up uh, Palestinian civilian, civilian casualties, both in reality and also um, in terms of the numbers that they claim, which are, so far as I can tell, even higher than the reality. Um, Joe, Ord, Ord expressed the view that Israel has gone uh, above and beyond what it's required to do to minimize civilian casualties. Do you share that view uh, or do you think that the uh, just from what we know, unreliable though the numbers may be, that the numbers of civilian casualties is simply becoming unacceptable and that Israel needs to find a more narrowly targeted way of fighting this war? Yeah, well, I, I think that Israel is, is doing some doing some some right things here. I mean, this the issuance of this map and doing things like that are, <clears throat> excuse me, are, are very very important. That said, I think the the point. I mean, I, I can, I can in my own experience, I can all I can just say, you know, when you ask those questions, have we done everything we can uh, about this? You know, I think in your in. In my, at least in my experience, there was always more that we could do, and it was always always linked to the evolution of the of the situation. And so, you know, I, I took you through a discussion in Afghanistan of, you know, we were absolutely convinced the safest thing for civilians was for us to just go in there at night when they're sleeping and just by surprise get everything under control. And but in fact, that was it was. It was not that it was not the best way of doing it, and we had to evolve over time. So I think uh, I think the important piece here is that uh, is that the Israelis are doing some 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 of the right things here, trying to notify, trying to move people around in a very very difficult situation. But they also they have to continue to evolve this, and I think they do have to have an appreciation for the situation here. Um, I mean, this is the, there are people all over the place moving around, and so uh, you've got to take that into consideration they've got to continue to put the extra step forward to try to minimize that after all they 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 will be neighbors when all of this is uh 
is is over with. So there is a there is a need to do that. There is a tactic that they have been applying that I think is a good approach, and that is this idea of getting in and surrounding areas. And, you know, we saw this in Gaza City. Get in, get get on multiple axes or multiple approaches. Get in, establish control, and then you're in a much better position not only to understand what is happening, but to communicate about it and then take measures to uh, to mitigate it. And I think that's a good you know, military tactic uh, in these situations that they can continue to uh, continue to apply. I've seen a number of suggestions that if Israel would take the measure of flooding the tunnels, for example, um, that it would be more narrowly targeted to Hamas. But then I've seen critics say that it would run the risk of collapsing buildings uh, into the tunnels and, of course, a grave risk to the hostages who were who were probably being held in those tunnels. Uh, any thoughts about that, Joe? And or I'll ask you. Yeah, the same I, I, uh, I'm, 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 I'm not sure on the technical details <laughs> of doing all that. I mean, that certainly sounds like an an option there. But again, there's there's you know that like like everything in this conflict, there are trade offs on 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 both sides of this thing. So I mean, this is uh, this might be a might be a viable tactic for what they do, but it's important to make sure they look at all the risk factors associated with which you just covered several of them right there. Or any thoughts about about attacking the tunnels specifically and and how you deal with that from the standpoint of, of the law of armed conflict. We've really never seen a war like this that was so extensively uh, grappling with the fact that the that the enemy is located underground. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not an expert, unfortunately, on the uh, the sort of uh, flooding flooding of tunnels. I haven't seen enough analysis of it uh, to know, uh, you know, whether whether it makes sense or not. Whether it's, you know, I mean, I think you got to keep in mind always the principle of proportionality, a key part of the law of armed conflict, which is, you know, you're prohibited from military action that will cause injury or death to civilians or damage to civilian objects that is excessive in relation to the military advantage gained. Excessive in relation to the military, and that that calculus is based on the uh, the warfighter, the commander uh, before the action is taken. Uh, it's not a post hoc analysis, and um, the. Uh, you know, you 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 do your best to minimize uh, collateral damage, to minimize civilian casualties. Every civilian uh, death or injury is is a, a tragedy, but um, it's not a it's not an algebra problem. Uh, you, you can't say that uh, just because this many civilians were killed uh, means that the Israelis are violating uh, the law of armed conflict. You certainly can't do that. Uh, you know, with regard to the to the conflict as a whole. Uh, you know. You can do it maybe more to the degree with a with a given strike, uh, but again, it's um, you know it's what did the commander know before he uh, before he ordered the attack before uh, the bomb was dropped, and you have to look at the military advantage. And the Israelis believe that they are fighting for a variety of reasons for the future of their state. Uh, they need to ensure that Hamas can't do this again, and they need to send a message to Hezbollah, which is um, looking to do the same thing that they can't uh, do something similar. So the stakes are very very high for the Israelis. This is not a war of choice. This is not a war that they wanted. This was a war that was thrust upon. Upon them. I want to go now to some of the questions uh, in the uh, in the Q&A. So let me begin with uh, some of those. So uh, my colleague Jonathan Moreno asked, despite the IDF warnings, there have been reports of loss of internet and cellular access for Gazans that make it difficult for civilians to learn about those warnings. Can you tell to what degree that is a failure on the Israeli side? Do either of you feel you can address that? I, I'm not. I'm not sure that I that I that I can. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, it's obviously a very uh, fluid situation here in terms of how people are moving around, how they're receiving information and stuff like that. Uh, uh, again, I just think what the what what the Israeli forces uh, clearly they're trying to take some measures to. Get get civilians out of the areas in which they are conducting operations, and I, you know, the the, the maps are an important part of this, but it, it's not a fire and forget. They've got to continue to look at ways that they can continue to make sure that that message resonates. Not sure if I'm answering the question there or not, but 
or do you have any any comment on that yeah i mean i'd say look i mean this is this is a war right and uh, under the law of armed conflict you're required not to interfere with you know things like food going to your enemy but you're not you're not required to provide your your enemy with internet access um or frankly to interfere with the provision of internet access that that wasn't part of the geneva conventions uh there's certainly operational advantages to uh, making it hard for hamas to communicate with each other um but obviously that has to be balanced against the effort to notify civilians and is it easier to notify civilians if you have uh, internet up and running uh yeah it, it is it is easier to notify civilians but here i i think we're not talking about law of armed conflict here we're talking about uh people PR and nice to haves. Uh. So um, I have many questions from a single user. Um, I'm going to pick through all of them, but the tenor of them is: um, is this, in effect, not a genocide against the um, Gazan people? So I don't know if anybody wants to address the question of genocide against Gazans. This is this is not a genocide against Gazans. That's really an outrageous assertion, frankly. Uh, what this is is a, is a, is an attempt by Hamas to commit genocide against Israel. It's right in their charter. Right in their charter, it talks about you know the day will come when every tree says there's a Jew behind me, come kill him. Uh, this is a part and parcel of what Hamas is trying to do. They're the ones who killed civilian women and children. What Israel is trying to do is defend itself against that. If Israel were trying to commit genocide against uh, uh, against the people of Gaza. They could do it in one second with one nuclear bomb. What they're trying to do is save lives while, tr while rooting out Hamas. That is the real genocidal party here. I think it's an outrageous and insulting assertion that Israel is committing genocide. They're by no means doing that. They're defending themselves against genocide. Another question uh, that I do think is worth addressing is about um, the relationship uh, to the U.S., um, uh, and let me just preface this by saying we may see a little bit of a difference in tone between President Biden's uh, comments about the war and um, Secretary Blinken's comments. Secretary Blinken has this past week said that the casualty numbers are, are way too high and we have, uh, we have not heard those assertions from President Biden and we have um, on the contrary heard um, you know, repeated expressions of support from uh, President Biden. Uh, we heard uh, quite critical remarks from uh, the vice president uh, in the last few days. Um, the questioner asked whether or not the U.S. will accept the huge immigration numbers from Palestinians that have no more homes, jobs, universities, school, water, food, or infrastructure. I think this is actually a, a, an important question to ask whether or not U.S. immigration policy uh, would change to adapt. We know that Egypt is not accepting uh, Palestinians uh, and is keeping that Rafah gate firmly closed. Uh, is this something that we think uh, the U.S. ought to perhaps accept some responsibility for under the circumstances? Do either of you want to speak to U.S. immigration policy on this? A far yeah, I'm, from what I'm, we've been talking I'm not an immigration policy expert here. I, I just I, I would just note that you know our, our our experience in this area most recently has been fairly limited. I mean, we took some amount of Afghans into the country. We took some amount of Syrians into the country during the Syrian civil war. Uh, we've done that in some other uh, in some Ukrainians as well uh, into the country, but uh, <clears throat> these have generally been fairly limited. We haven't seen something on the scale of what we did at the end of the Vietnam War in 1975 when we moved a lot of Hmongs and others into our into our country. So uh, obviously, uh, I think everybody can certainly appreciate that this issue um, it bounces up against uh, you know kind of a very significant debate we, uh, we that we've had ongoing in our own country about uh, immigration policy. I think what is important is that uh, the United States should play a role as as the international community should in addressing uh, how we how we take care of people that have been displaced by uh, by war. I think this is this important and this is a this is un an unfortunate feature of this region right here. Uh, we still have people displaced from in Lebanon for, for, for decades. We have people displaced in Afghanistan. We have people displaced in, um, in, in Syria and, and the 
to some extent in Iraq. So this is a feature of it, and it's uh, and and in in and it's in our interest to do this because it is in the seeds of these displacement camps and other things where where uh, terrorist ideologies and other things are 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 born from people that are constantly uh, uh, in in this situation. So it's in our interest to address that, whether uh, they all have to come to the United States or not. I think is a different discussion, uh, but there certainly has to be a there certainly has to be an international approach to how we address the challenge of people that are displaced by this. And I note, uh, Joe, that in the wake of the um, withdrawal of U.S. forces from uh, Afghanistan and uh, the takeover by the Taliban, uh, there were rather desperate attempts to get uh, many Afghans out who had worked with U.S. forces, and the U.S. was not always receptive to, uh, to those efforts. That's right. That's right. I mean, I, one of my one of my criticisms has been we have, we, you know, we have uh, we have people that work for us now. We're and work for us in Afghanistan. That we want to bring that you know, we kind of promise that we bring to the country here. Um, we won't because we we don't have, we don't, we're not satisfied with the level of vetting that goes along with us. So we we've got to address this and uh, and uh, from a, from a U.S. standpoint and then certainly from a military standpoint as uh, as well. Uh, we have some excellent questions from our board member, Rob Kellner. Uh, first, he asked, did we disrupt telecoms and internet in Iraq? Uh, and do we consider that acceptable? Joe, I don't know if you want to speak to that. To my knowledge, we did not. Uh, we did not blanket or target uh, uh, countrywide um, countrywide uh, internet outage. Um, you know, without going into a whole lot of detail, we have we have tactical capabilities and other things we can use to temporarily disable things uh, to you know give a you know to provide a an advantage to a military force that is going into a, a you know a, a difficult situation and make it difficult for our enemy to communicate. While we're doing something, we have the ability to do some of that stuff. But to my knowledge, we did not do things. And another like question, that. yeah, another question about Iraq and Afghanistan, which is that how did we track civilian casualties? Did we rely on statistics from local authorities, or did we track? Did we engage in our own tracking efforts? What? How did we keep track of civilian casualties? Uh, yes, yes, yes. I mean, I think we looked at all of these things. I mean, certainly the United Nations and uh, and some of those organizations were present and and uh, and and their their numbers we paid attention to. We certainly paid attention to our own numbers. Uh, we looked at things that were being reported from a variety of different service uh, sources. You know, uh, you know, throughout the. Um, you know, our, our targeted operations against terrorist organizations uh, using drone strikes and things like this. So, you know, there are a number of organizations that arose like Air Wars, for example, who who put a lot of effort into tracking these types of things. I don't always agree with the assessments they made, but we paid attention to those things. And it's important uh, to, to understand what's what's out there. That's part of operating effectively in the information environment and you know, protecting the overall mission. Part of the mission at the end of the, this was to, you know, was to you know, be able to take care of people and be able to uh, have a relationship here. So you do have to pay attention to all of those things. And so we tried to look at, we tried to look at all of those uh, those things. My colleague Tom Baker asks, would you please explain why Egypt is keeping the Rafah gate closed? And we talked about this a little bit last week. I, I would add to that question, why has there not been more international pressure on Egypt to open the gate and take refugees? Or I don't know if you have thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, the sense is that um, Egypt uh, wants to keep the Rafah gate closed because they don't want um, they don't want Hamas escaping into Egypt and they don't uh, want uh, Gazans uh, coming into Egypt. E Egypt has, uh, this is, you know, uh, President Sisi of Egypt has a very negative uh, sort of history with uh, the Muslim Brotherhood that is basically the uh, the parent uh, organization of Hamas. Uh, he has been fighting them himself. Uh, there are, in fact, a lot of, uh, you know, the Arab states that uh, are, uh quietly, it seems, uh, calling on Israel to root out uh, Hamas because they, they hate the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and, you know, that goes to the question that was raised 
earlier of, you know, what responsibility the U.S. has. You know, I, I agree with, with the general that the U.S. had responsibility in Afghanistan to those who had fought with us and their families, et cetera, et cetera, to bring them to the United States. I mean, that's the decent thing to do. But in Gaza, you know, why is it that Gaza is the, in the state that it's in? Gaza is in the state that it's in because of Hamas misrule. What is There's been plenty of aid over the years to Gaza. What has happened to it? You can look online and you can see videos of Hamas digging up water pipes and turning them into rockets. Uh, you can uh, read online about how the Hamas leadership is living in luxury in Qatar, and estimates are that uh, you know Hania and others have siphoned off billions of dollars from the aid. Uh, to uh, to Gaza. And so, you know, I think in terms of who has the responsibility here, uh, people have to look to Hamas for the responsibility for what happened. They launched this war. They've, you know, taken, they, they could have created, you know, a Singapore uh, out of uh, out of Gaza. But instead, what, what they did was spend, you know, rather than um, uh, you know, bomb shelters for their civilians. They create. They invested money in these tunnel networks. Uh, they are all about uh, death to Israelis, and if 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 death to Palestinians is is necessary to achieve that, they're perfectly willing uh, to uh, to to kill Palestinians as well. And that's that's where the responsibility lies with Hamas for what this for the sad situation the Palestinian civilians are in now. And just another um, uh, comment on the same topic, the refusal on the part of Egypt to allow refugees, is that actually a violation of international law? I don't know the answer to that. that that's... Nor do I. I. I don't either. Um, there's a question uh, from a former intern of ours about um, weapons uh, that U.S. is supplying to Israel. Uh, what sort of weapon are we supplying and um, are we supplying the right weapons? Uh, will we continue to supply weapons? Should we? Um, and uh, what does Israel need? I know one of the one of the one of the principal uh, munitions we are providing are the munitions that are used for the Iron Dome system, and uh, obviously I think that has uh, uh, that's 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 purely a defensive uh, system here, and I think it can be fairly well established that that has saved a lot of lives um, from uh, you know not only from the onslaught that's been going on since the seventh of October, but uh, uh, prior to that as well. So in in my view, that's 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 good. That's Gets, that's key helping keep things under control and it's it's uh, it's protecting civilians so I think that is the that is the case um I, I to the extent of other stuff that we are providing I'm sure there is some other stuff I think it's important to note that uh, this is uh, the Israeli army is not or the Israeli defense forces is not the Ukrainian army um so the scope and depth of things that we are providing to Ukraine are probably much different than what we're providing to Israel which is a modern well equipped equipped, well-trained, well-led military um, uh, that has a lot of these, had, that in, in some areas are, are very clear peers to us uh, in some of their capabilities. So it's probably not the same types of things that uh, we might see in, in Ukraine. Any thoughts, Orrin, about um, U.S. weapon supplies to Israel? No, just to say that um, obviously the um, the U.S. makes you know, incredibly sophisticated precision uh, weapons, and to the degree that you want your allies to be able to minimize civilian casualties, you want to provide them with sophisticated, precise weapons so they don't have to rely on less sophisticated, less precise weapons, which are more likely to result in civilian casualties. I think that's very important to underscore, and it's, it's been extremely helpful in the Ukraine context. The U.S. has uh, supplied very important intelligence support to Ukraine, and some of that uses very sophisticated um, uh, technology, uh, semi-autonomous uh, marine vehicles, for example, uh, that have been extremely important in the Black Sea. Um, and so to the extent that advanced technologies can help to minimize civilian casualties, uh, it's, it's very important for members of Congress to understand who are opposed to 
uh, U.S. Uh, weapons supplies and support for Israel, that that may actually help to reduce civilian casualty levels when we can find the right technology, technologies that will help uh, Israel to hone their civilian casualty reduction uh, and mitigation efforts. So uh, we are at the one o'clock hour. I thank you both enormously for this a uh, hugely informative briefing. I hope you will both come back again. We will be doing this weekly uh, for quite a while. We'll have uh, next week, we will have uh, General uh, Jim Cartwright uh, and our own board chair, uh, Mort Halperin, uh, to talk about some of the uh, more general geopolitical issues surrounding this situation. And uh, thank you again, and I'll turn it back to our executive director, Dave Johnson. Yes, I'd like to uh, echo Claire's uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. And as Claire said, uh, we will have our next uh, in this series on uh, Thursday, December 14th at 12 noon. And today's session will be up shortly, uh, either today or tomorrow on Searle's uh, YouTube channel. And as Claire had mentioned, uh, she will be moderating a conversation uh, with uh, Searle's executive board chair, Dr. Morton Halperin who had previous high-level positions within the State Department, the Defense Department, as well as in academia. And he will be uh, joined by General James Cartwright, who is also on Searle's executive board. He's the former vice chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And they will discuss uh, broader geopolitical aspects to the Israel-Hamas war, including the, war, the role of Iran and other global powers. Um, our event team will include a link in the register uh, registration for this upcoming event. And thank you, and uh, everyone have a good rest of your afternoon.